Good evening. As chairman of the Hartford Board of Education, I hereby call to order the August 20th, 2019 meeting. I wish to extend a warm welcome to everyone present and to our television viewers. The board, superintendent, and I are pleased that you have joined us as we celebrate achievement, review information, and make policy decisions related to the effective operation of the Hartford Public Schools. This is a regular meeting and all items that will be discussed or voted on this evening have been posted as required by state law. As the Hartford Board of Education, we are here to set goals, listen to reports of the superintendent, approve budgets, contracts, and personnel appointments, and make policy for the district. We are not here to make management decisions or solve the problems of individuals. Management is the responsibility of the superintendent. The monthly meetings of the board are open to the public. They are the time when the board conducts its business of governing the school system in a public arena. The regular meetings are not meetings with the public. Therefore, comments from the audience will be confined to the time designated for the public to address the board. The curum and courtesy are important elements in effective public meetings. Please silence your cell phones or communication devices and refrain from talking while others are speaking. Since it is legally mandated that proceedings be accurately recorded, I may have to ask for order periodically should noise begin to interfere with our recording capabilities. I am pleased that you have taken the time this evening to join us. We are very proud of this school system and thank you for your interest in the Hartford Public Schools. Now I will read the statement in Spanish. Buenas noches. Como Presidente de la Junta de Educación de Hartford, he llamado a orden esta reunión ordinaria de la Junta del 20 de agosto 2019. Damos una cálida bienvenida a todas las personas presentes y a nuestros televidentes. La Junta y la Superintendente se complacen que se han unido a nosotros para celebrar logros, revisar información y tomar decisiones relacionadas con el funcionamiento efectivo de las escuelas públicas de Hartford. Esta es una reunión ordinaria y todos los asuntos que serán discutidos o votados en esta tarde han sido notificados como lo requiere la ley estatal. Como Junta de Educación de Hartford, estamos aquí para establecer metas, escuchar los informes de la superintendente, aprobar los presupuestos, contratos y nombramientos de personal y establecer normas para el distrito. No estamos aquí para tomar decisiones administrativas o resolver problemas individuales. La administración es la responsabilidad de la superintendente. Las reuniones mensuales de la Junta están abiertas al público. Son el momento en que la Junta lleva a cabo su tarea de gobernar el sistema escolar en un espacio público. Las reuniones regulares no son reuniones con el público, por lo tanto, los comentarios de la audiencia se limitarán al tiempo designado para el público dirigirse a la Junta. El decoro y la cortesía son elementos importantes en reuniones públicas eficaces. Por favor, silencie sus teléfonos celulares o dispositivos de comunicación y absténganse de hablar mientras otros están hablando ya que es mandato legal de que los procedimientos sean grabados con precisión, es posible que tengamos que pedir orden periódicamente si el ruido interfiere con nuestras capacidades de grabación. Nos complace que se haya tomado el tiempo esta tarde para unirse a nosotros. Estamos muy orgullosos de este sistema escolar y les damos gracias por su interés en las escuelas públicas de Hartford. Y si alguien necesita traducción eh, al español, tenemos personal disponible. Eh, Tiene la mano alzada en la parte de atrás. Pueden verla ella si necesitan traducción. Gracias. We as the board in collaboration with the superintendent and district leadership are committed to cultivating a culture of excellence at all levels of HPS. We thank you for taking the time to attend tonight's board meeting. And we appreciate you coming out to learn more about Hartford Public Schools and for sharing your thoughts and concerns. We have established a protocol to track and respond to concerns raised. We want you to know that we take your concerns seriously, and to that end, we will have staff available for immediate follow-up if follow-up is required. After you have finished speaking, a staff member may come up to you, ready to take your information down. They will follow up with an update within 48 hours. As a reminder, you have three minutes to speak, and at the two minute mark, Ms. Santiago will ring the bell, letting you know you have one minute left. At the second bell, please wrap up your comments. 
Now Chairman Flores will read this in Spanish. Nosotros, la Junta de Educación, en colaboración con la Superintendente y personal del Distrito, estamos comprometidos a cultivar una cultura de excelencia en todos los niveles de las escuelas públicas de Hartford. Les agradecemos se haya tomado el tiempo para asistir a la reunión de la Junta esta noche. Les agradecemos su participación y su deseo de aprender más sobre las escuelas públicas de Hartford, y también por compartir sus pensamientos y preocupaciones. Nosotros tomamos sus preocupaciones muy seriamente, y hemos establecido un protocolo para el seguimiento y respuesta a inquietudes planteadas. Tenemos personal disponible para seguimiento inmediato para los casos que lo requieren. Una vez que usted haya terminado de hablar, un miembro del personal estará disponible para tomar su información. Esa persona investigará su caso y se comunicará con usted dentro de 48 horas. Les recordamos que tienen tres minutos para hablar. Cuando hayan pasado dos minutos, la señorita Santiago sonará el timbre dejándole saber que le queda un minuto. Al segundo sonido, por favor, termine sus comentarios. Michael Downs. Thank you. Evening, board. Evening, board. Uh, Michael Downs, uh, 74 Rosemont Street in Hartford. Um, I, uh, well, I'm glad that we're ready for a new school year, and um, I'm glad that uh, Weaver, the Weaver building seems to finally be open, and uh, one of the things that I did hope about it was uh, there'd be more public announcement about it, and the uh, uh, composition of the uh, students there, and um, also uh, I hope that the budget made it possible for an area for vocational technical education, something we're missing in all of our high schools and all of our middle schools, uh, which should be opening this year as well, or at least this year and next year. Um, also, there I see there should be uh, uh, some coordination uh, between the Harper Public Schools and the uh, Harper Public Library. Um, I've, I've read about some, but I don't uh, see anything extensive. Uh, there's certainly um, room for libraries in every school and librarians in every school, and especially uh, in the high schools and the middle schools, but even the elementary schools uh, need a library, at least a part-time librarian. Um, also, there should be coordination between uh, uh, the Harvard Public Schools and recreation. Uh, certainly there's a need for vast e extension of uh, recreation throughout the city and uh, there's a need for it and there's uh, gymnasiums in every um, uh, every building uh, or every school building and they should be used. I see the Simpson Waverly building um, is up for uh, relinqu relinquishment by the Hartford Public Schools, the Hartford Board of Education. Uh, they have an excellent gym and a good place for uh, recreation to hide out. Um, also, what about the uh, gymnasium at uh, Milner, the new Milner Middle School? It's only half a gym. Should be, uh, shouldn't there be uh, uh, plans for expansion? There's certainly room there to uh, uh, add on to the gymnasium. Thank you. Hi, Yeni. Good evening, everyone. Superintendent, hope you all had a restful um, summer. I know it was really short, right? But I'm hoping you had an opportunity to get out and just do nothing, do what you want to do. So I'm Hyacinth Yeni, and I'm really excited about the new school year, really excited about what's happening for Harford High. I'm looking forward to much better year than last year, OK? And as, I, as always, I'm here to make sure that we're, as a superintendent, you're supporting your principals. And the consumers, that's really so important. Your teachers, your principals. This is really important for you to show them that you care, making sure that they have the resources in their building. And I know it's a lot of buildings. 
And we need to, you know, really seriously talk about a lot of these buildings that we need to close some of them that we need to. We don't have the kids we used to have anymore. So we need to look, and I know it's gonna be a hard thing to do, but you must do it. And I know everyone is not gonna be pleased, but we can't please everyone. And so therefore, seriously, financially, we won't be able to afford it. So think about that. And the other issue I'm here about is to talk about, I am in full support of Beth helping us with classical magnet school, Sullivan. And I'm gonna tell you why it is so important to save that building. My three kids graduate from classicals. And because of the education that they got there, I stick around and continue to fight for that program because I know it's a great program. We just need to make sure it's supported by somebody who knows what it means for classical education. It's a different type of education that takes our children places, all right? My kids are all, they all turn out to be doctors, okay? So if it was a bad thing, I would never come here to support it. But I know we can put classical back on the map. We had a hard year last year, but I'm hoping that we can put this school back on the map as one of our best school, okay? We talk about we want more suburban, we want a diverse group of kids to come into this building. Well, when you have something good, it doesn't matter, they will come. So I'm really encouraging you to support, as the board, to support Beth Salvin for this position. Thank you. And I'll be back. Thank you. Thank you. And thanks a lot, Superintendent, for listening. Araceli Rodriguez. Buenas tardes. Mi nombre es Araceli Rodríguez. Mi, mi situación, que yo creo que muchas personas estamos iguales, es de que yo tengo a mi niño en un preschool y yo cuando fui a una junta de padres empezaron a hablar y empezaron a hablar en inglés. Y, y yo me quedé que yo no entendí nada. Se siente algo una impotencia bien feo que te están hablando y no te están diciendo nada. O sea, bueno, los que entienden sí sabían, pero los que no entendemos inglés no, no sabían. Estaban traduciendo a otra persona, pero la otra persona se quedaba muchos lazos que no decía nada. Y ya después una madre de familia dijo, ¿saben qué? Yo les voy a, yo les voy a ayudar a las que no entienden. Y nos estuvo explicando, pero otra decía que no, que eso no, no iba así, que era de otra forma. Y pues la verdad no entendimos nada. Y yo creo que el hecho de que nosotros no, no conozcamos todavía el inglés y que estamos tratando de aprender, yo creo que también tienen que considerar eso. No sé si a ustedes, con todo respeto, a ustedes o a todos los que estamos aquí, no sé si les ha tocado pasar que están en una situación parecida y que no entienden y ustedes les interesa el beneficio de sus hijos o de sus sobrinos o sus, o, o sus nietos o sus nietas y que no haya quien te traduzca. A mí la verdad me interesa mucho y yo les, les inculco que si podrían ayudarnos a nosotras, las que no sabemos todavía el inglés, que lo vamos a saber, porque cuando uno ama a su hijo o a la persona que tú quieres, Tú haces todo lo posible por aprender por tu hijo o por las demás personas. Disculpen. Gracias por, los, por su atención.
um, mom, mom for, uh, felt powerless um, when her children were in preschool and she wasn't able to communicate. There were other people interpreting, but uh, not interpreting all the conversation that was going on. And very respectfully, she would like to ask, you know, if you guys know how it feels when you don't speak the language and, um, and, and not able to communicate and being understood by others. Christina Pascal. Martha Palma. Buenas tardes a todos. Good afternoon to all. Eh, la, especialmente con la doctora Torres Rodríguez. Especialmente con la doctora Torres Rodríguez. Quiero manifestar una experiencia que tuve hace. hace algunos meses. I would like to talk about an experience I had a few months ago. Honestamente, yo fui con mi nieto. Honestly, I went with my grandchild. A una escuela que queda eh, al lado de la biblioteca de la Park Street en Hartford. To a school that's next to the library on Park Street in Hartford. En un parquecito que hay allí en, en al frente de esa escuela. In a small park that's there. In front of that school. En horas que no estaban los niños afuera, fui con mi nieto y para que él se divirtiera en uno de los juegos que hay allí, porque estaba solo. At a time that there were no children there, I went with my grandchild so he can have some fun because the place was by itself. Mi nieto tiene, en ese entonces tenía tres añitos y medio, no, una personita que no se sabe defender, pues estaba conmigo. My grandchild at the time was about three and a half years old, and he wouldn't be able to stand up for himself. He was with me. Y fue la hora de salida del, del, del descanso de los profesores y los alumnos de esa institución. And it was the time for recess for the teacher and the students at that school. Cuando en el momento que salió una de las profesoras americanas, ella habla puro inglés, eh, salió tratando mal al niño y a mí, diciéndonos grau, grau, que no fuéramos. And at that time, a teacher came out, an American teacher that didn't speak, she only spoke English. She came out and said to me and the child, get out, get out. Mm, la verdad, sentí mucha impotencia porque ella era americana, habla inglés. Yo hablo poco inglés. I really felt powerless. Um, she was American, spoke English, and I speak very little English. Pero entonces, en lo poco que yo sabía, yo traté a ella de manifestarle lo que yo estaba sintiendo en ese momento. But with the little that I know, I tried to explain to her how I was feeling at that time. Y le dije pues que el niño se estaba era, divirtiendo un rato pero que si ella quería con buenos modales, yo me iba, ¿sí? Entonces, una profesora que estaba con ella, que salió también, que hablaba inglés y español, empezó a traducirle lo que yo le decía, pero ella es muy indignada, muy enojada conmigo, como si fuéramos, nos, hizo, nos, nos humilló prácticamente, y yo me sentí muy impotente al no poderme defender porque ella me hablaba en inglés. Y la otra profesora le, le decía, pero se reía, como que se, se mofaba. So I told her that very politely I'd be more than happy to leave. And then another teacher that heard us that spoke English and Spanish came and translated and kind of like, you know, we tried to explain to her that we were going to leave. Um, but they, were, they kept laughing at us. De verdad que doctora Rodríguez, Torres Rodríguez, con mucho respeto le digo esto, 
Eh, hay que prestar atención en esto porque nosotros los que venimos, sobre todo los hispanos, que no hablamos el idioma que hablan en esta, en esta tierra, eh, en ocasiones nos sentimos humillados porque nos sentimos solos, desprotegidos en este caso. Y siendo un niño así, no es posible que, que lo traten de esa manera. And um, Dr. Torres Rodriguez, with all your respect, we need somebody that can help us and represent us. We feel uh, that we cannot speak on this place and we feel sometimes humiliated and not able to express ourselves or communicate. Yo pienso que esto tiene mucho que ver con los derechos del niño y con los derechos que tenemos nosotros también como latinos. No por eso nos traten de esa manera. I think that it has to do with the rights that the children have and the rights that we have as Latinos. Please don't allow them to treat us that way. Es todo lo que yo sentí, por eso lo estoy manifestando y la verdad nunca se me puede olvidar esa expresión que es la profesora tuvo hacia nosotros. Muchas gracias. It's everything that I felt and that's why I'm expressing it and how that teacher makes us feel. Thank you. Walter Ezra. Eh, buenas tardes. En mi nombre es Walter Enrique Sea. Good afternoon. Eh, My name is Walter Enrique Sea. Eh, en especial para Dora Torres Rodríguez. Especially to Dr. Torres Rodríguez. Es que lo que pasa es que me gustaría, eh, no soy padre de familia, pero tengo mi sobrino y me gustaría que a veces en las escuelas hubiera como un grupo de latinos en, que en el cual eh, como a veces hacen reuniones y a veces hablan en inglés y no entendemos. I am not a father, but I have my nephew, and I would like so that sometimes they will have a group of Latinos at the schools, because sometimes they have groups and we're not able to understand. En el cual se nos presentará como una herramienta, o no sé, un equipo o algo, alguna persona que hablar en español y él hablar, le hablar en inglés y le hiciera saber qué opinamos de pronto de, de, de cierta ocasión que esté pasando en la escuela el del niño o del padre. And we, I would like to ask for a person or a tool that you guys can provide to us so that we're able to communicate and that that person can express our opinion in English so that they can express the concerns for the children or the parents. Porque pues la otra vez yo estuve en una reunión de mi sobrino junto con mi cuñada y me di cuenta de que están hablando pero casi no se entendía realmente y tuvieron que colocar a una persona que hablara, que traduciera de español a inglés pero aún así a ver si esa persona se queda nula, no, 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 no sabía qué decirnos. Because one time I went to a meeting with my, a meeting with my nephew and my sister-in-law and they had somebody that was translating but the person then stayed quiet and they were really not understanding and you guys need somebody that speaks English and Spanish to go back and forth. Eso era lo que quería comunicarles, que me escucharan y que escucharan pues a los latinos realmente que somos la mayoría grande que estamos aquí y que nos apoyaran en eso. And that's what I wanted to communicate for you guys to listen and support us, the Latinos here, and give us support on that. Muchas gracias y muchas gracias a todos. Thank you and thank you to all. Millie Yosenega. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Millie Arsenegas. I am the executive director of the Hartford Parent University. Um, I see on the agenda, Hartford Performs, renewing their contract. That's a great thing. Uh, we are partners of Hartford Performs, and uh, they do a great job. So that's a good thing. Um, We've been in, with Hartford Parent University, we've been training parents all summer long. And one of the biggest obstacles that we're facing is communication. Uh, when it comes to Latino families, not being able to express themselves 
and the get the reciprocal, right? So, you know, if there are 15 parents that we've trained and they only speak Spanish, where do they fit in? Those are the questions that were asked. They go to a meeting, it's all in English. They want to volunteer, they don't know where to go. So, you know, this conversation that you heard here tonight is very important because there are parents out there that are willing to do uh, volunteer work and participate in meetings, but if they don't have the tools in these meetings so that we can have a translator or, you know, uh, machines so that they can participate, there's going to be half of the population in some of these schools that are not going to get the information. I think the district does a really good job in sending out English and Spanish. That's awesome. But we need to think further. How do they participate in activities in the schools? How do they communicate in the main office? Some of these main offices, I go in there, and there is no Spanish speaking. So they grab parents that speak both English and Spanish, and they tell them to translate for them. We cannot continue to operate like the Latinos don't exist. We're here, and we're here to stay. So we have to find all of those tools that we need in these schools so that they can participate. If we can find translators for here, we can find translators for all the schools. Thank you. And that concludes public comments. And uh, we move on to reports. I'm going to speak briefly about some developments uh, in our facilities area. And I think the superintendent wanted to save it as a big announcement for convocation, but I'm excited about it. I want to talk about it now. When, when we started the, uh, with the DME, and you know, our goal is to make all our schools of equal quality. And, and we've got a lot of plans in the academic area. And, and I think that, I know that we did not at the time expect that we would be able to do much in the area of facilities other than moving and getting rid of the worst facilities. Uh, but we've been working very hard with our Office of uh, School Construction uh, Grants and Review and their director, uh, Mr. Costa Diamantes, has been a, a wonderful uh, partner and ally to us. Uh, the superintendent and I have been involved in, in many meetings and we have obtained from the state legislature a commitment to fund all of our projects that are approved by June of 2022, which is the closing date for the DME, at 95% reimbursement. Uh, this will allow us to engage in construction projects going forward that we had no idea we could do because now the city generally is expected to contribute 20% and our city cannot afford to do that. Uh, so at next month's board meeting, we will be approving the plans for Buckley, which will be renovated, and for Burns. And we are looking at our portfolio of buildings to see what more we can do within this period that we have been uh, uh, allotted at this higher percentage. And certainly we're not ready to talk about what else we're going to do. It, it requires a lot of work and a lot of analysis. But it's important that you understand that the state legislature and the governor has considered our district model for excellence to be of importance and have decided to 
uh, support us, not just by talking about it, but with dollars. And that, I believe, is, is extraordinarily important. And I, I am very happy and very proud uh, uh, of our team and very grateful to the Office of School Construction Grants and Review that has worked so hard with us to achieve that. Thank you. Madam Superintendent. Thank you, uh, Chairman Flores, and good evening, everyone. Buenas tardes a todos. Um, I'm actually going to um, expand on um, some of what you uh, were saying, uh, Chairman Flores, just to be very specific. Um, Senate Bill 1210 uh, was passed on a special session on July 22nd. And the highlight of the bill is that um, all of our capital improvement projects will get 95% reimbursement. Um, and just to uh, kind of put everything in context, um, there have been projects that we've been working on, smaller projects as part of the District Model of Excellence, the DME. And I wanted to just frame for us um, the investments, which um, sand uh, roof, the, these approvals were from August 2018 to July uh, 2019, so in a year um, time frame. Um, investments for the sand roof at $1 million, Burns roof replacement, $3 million, Burns uh, four new pre-K classrooms um, for magnet uh, seat allocations uh, at $5 million, um, Buckley, uh, some code uh, issues that we had to address, $5 million, the relocation of our central office to Buckley. We are leaving next year, our central office at 960 Main, where we're delivering on what we said we were going to do. So that is a, a $5 million investment at the Buckley site. Uh, and the latest um, approvals uh, uh, this past July, the Burns renovation at 47.7 million and the Buckley renovation at $149 million, a total um, of approvals in a year of $215 million. Um, that's a very lonely clap, but um, I'll take it. <laughs> And I do just want to express gratitude uh, to our board for their leadership. Um, and what I did tell them is that it's not every day that we see legislation that is crafted and approved referencing that the projects are to, and I quote, uh, implement the district model of excellence that was approved by the Board of Education on January 23rd, 2018. So um, we clearly have a lot of work to do. Um, it is not just around the facilities. Um, we know that there are um, instructional improvements, making sure that our schools, our leadership, our, our instructional staff all get stronger, that we all get stronger together. And so this all fits, you know, as part of our larger plan. So I um, wanted to start uh, my report just adding to what um, Chairman Flores had stated. And now I'll just reference a few other elements. One is um, just an update on our summer programming um, and who was serviced uh, by our summer programming and why, uh, who, um, what was the need indicator and um, the actual amount of students served. And, um, you know, there were four programs this summer, which is for students in grades K through three, which is mandated. Uh, uh, for students to participate based on the need for academic, additional academic supports. And um, some of the practices were around literacy uh, and math with very specific curricula. And um, the need indicator um, was, you know, what we call our DIBLS um, assessment, which um, is for the lower grades around um, proficiency. And um, we were able to service 2,624 students, which is a 10% increase in enrollment from the previous summer. Uh, the second uh, program uh, offering this summer was our new program, our Summer Bridge, which, which was for uh, rising ninth graders. Um, and um, the need indicator that was identified here, as you all know, we're being intentional identifying the data that indicates where it is the additional supports are necessary. And we looked at the early warning indicator as our data point and noticed that 83% of students who had one or more early warning indicator in eighth grade would potentially fall off track when they got to ninth grade. So we wanted to be proactive and we were able to uh, serve 290 students. Um, our credit recovery program is a, a 
program that we've offered um, for several years now. It's a free credit uh, recovery program for students in uh, grades 9 through 12, and this is um, for students to uh, meet their uh, requirements if they were not successful in any specific course. And um, 686 students participated in the program, uh, which includes a, an 11% increase in enrollment from the previous year. And lastly, and um, very important for me to reference, is our extended school year program for our students with disabilities. Um, this is for um, extended service and extended school year education and related services, so that we can make sure that um, a student with a disability receives what is called um, the free and appropriate public education. And this is a program that we were not able in the past to offer at such an extend extended um, in an extended way. And um, we, were make, we made sure that our uh, students with individualized education programs, IEPs, um, you know, received the um, support and the services to prevent any summer regression so that our students can acquire additional critical skills and then avoid the interruption of service. What's important here is that 291 students were uh, served, and this is a 30% enrollment increase for our students with special needs over the summer. Um, so, wanted to reference that when we in Hartford Public Schools say that we are committed to serving all students, we mean all students. Um, and so it was important to us when developing our summer program that we looked at um, addressing the needs of everyone. Um, and with regard to uh, summer programming, we did centralize our, our program. We consolidated the summer program at 12 school sites. As you know, in previous years, each school site had one, two different programs. And again, we're trying to be efficient with our resources, our people, our time, and our money. And so we consolidated. We had nine early start sites and three summer bridge sites um, in order to maximize our resources. Uh, and so, um, not only did we centralize for budgetary needs, we went to just having two budget codes, and if you're wondering why that is significant, um, before that, we, the budgets and our expenditures were captured in 41 different budget codes. So think about um, the inefficiency that that created for um, summer programming while we're trying to um, speed up and get ready for the new school year. Uh, we were able to consolidate our food services and health services into 12 sites, which allowed us um, to uh, free up our labor resources to work for our Connecticut Summer Meals Program to make sure that students, uh, that anyone zero to 18 years of age had access to summer meals um, without interruption. I'll reference also the um, community-based organizations that uh, were partnered, shouldered up with us to uh, deliver summer programming. And so 321 unique organizations served uh, 3,864 students throughout the summer as well, all done in alignment with our priorities. Uh, congratulations to our team, our, not only our chief of schools, our chief academic officer, um, chief Avila, all of our department leaders um, around our new leader induction. Um, the new leader induction took place August 6th through the 8th, and it was designed to introduce and familiarize our new leaders to Hartford Public Schools. Um, they learned how to access our databases, um, uh, the Power School Performance Matters, the RISE uh, dashboards, um, and really got to understand our district model of excellence, our strategic plan, and um, how it is that we as central office support uh, the work that happens in, in our schools. Um, Want to also highlight that six of the 17 new leaders that we welcomed were from our uh, homegrown um, uh, aspiring leaders program that we had for the first year last year. 
at our administrator um, institute, uh, the, our three-day institute. We welcomed all of our school administrators, our principals, our assistant principals, and our central office staff. Um, and we really focused deeply three days on our work around equity, uh, our district priorities and the major actions, and we engage in collaborative learning experiences so that we can strengthen our relationships, developing what we call common understanding about what it is to have high quality teaching and learning happening uh, throughout our schools. This is work that we're gonna continue to do throughout the year. Um, we're not introducing any new um, initiatives. We're digging, we're, we're just being very intentional about the work that we said we were gonna live together, which was actually informed by our school-based leaders. Facilities, um, you know that we are relocating some schools, and so the relocation of staff and teaching materials have been completed. Um, including the vacating of former Kinsella High School on Locust Street, and we have um, given that they're walking in, probably as we speak, um, settling in uh, their new home on the Weaver campus. And we have begun to repurpose and relocate furniture from Milner School uh, that, of course, closed, as you know, to fulfill the needs of other schools throughout our district. So we're being very intentional and very smart with any resources that we can repurpose. Some uh, updates around our Office of Enrollment and School Choice. Uh, we continue to fill our magnet seats uh, when possible until October 1st. Uh, we are uh, entering the eighth round, actually, of magnet seat offerings. Lots of work happening um, in our Choice and Enrollment Office. And lastly, uh, Transportation Department has been uh, meeting with Autumn Transportation Weekly to ensure that there's excellence in how we launch this, uh, the, the new transition. Their new buses have arrived in Hartford and they are in the process of being registered. Uh, they are actually test running new routes as we speak. Um, and families have begun to get um, all of their information about uh, bus routes and, and times of bus pickups and drop-offs, and we know that we are excited about our new app, which we were able to demo yesterday at the Back to School Celebration at Dunkin' Donuts uh, Park, which uh, we were able to welcome uh, over 3,000 uh, students and families yesterday to join us, and so we debuted the app yesterday, which will be able to tell parents exactly where the bus is at any time um, without having to call um, the office. So again, trying to be responsive um, and communicating in real time with our families. Um, two points of celebration. One is that um, I ask that you join me in congratulate, uh, congratulating Daisy Torres, our Director of English Learner Services, Dual Language and World Languages, with um, her upcoming book release in December of 2019 that is entitled, I'll See You on the Bridge. And this book is a true story about pet loss inspired by the relationship between her son and their dog. And so we are honored to have an author on our executive team. And so we wish her the best on this new journey. Um, and the last um, celebratory remark for the night, Noah Webster Micro Society Magnet School um, received four stars, the highest recognition of excellence awarded um, within their international community. Uh, the Micro Society International um, created its star uh, system to recognize member schools and programs that demonstrate high commitment to academic standards, student empowerment and leadership, innovation, and community engagement. And so the results are compiled from a very lengthy process of surveys, interviews, and on-site observations and assessment. And so um, we want to acknowledge um, Noah Webster uh, for uh, their recognition. Um, and they're all going to be celebrated um, at their national convening. I hear I'm, that's exactly what I'm saying. These are, we, we actually committed um, with our school leaders to get into this practice of really celebrating um, our work, um, even the smallest of celebrations. Um, we know that oftentimes um, what gets the uh, attention are the negative stories. We have so many, so many positive stories each and every day in our classrooms, in our schools, at our district office, throughout our community. And so I ask that you don't miss out on those opportunities in your respective communities if you see those. That concludes my report. Thank you, Madam Superintendent.
if I may, I I to just clarify, you mentioned that Milner School closed. The building closed. Yes. The school has been relocated to a new facility. Beautiful. To a repurposed facility, former JMA building, which was renovated a few years ago. Beautiful facility, which is now Thurman Milner Middle School. So again, delivering on the work that we said we would do. Thank you for that, uh, Chairman Flores. Uh, the committees of the board do not meet during the summer, so we do not have any uh, committee reports. And uh, Ms. Santiago, do we have a quorum now? Okay, so we can move on to the business agenda. Uh, item 5. Point, I'm sorry, 4.1, administrative appointment. Motion that the Hartford Board of Vacation approve the superintendent's recommendation to appoint Bethany Sullivan to the position of principal at Classical Magnet School. And we have Ms. Sullivan and Ms. Uh, Avila Negron. Uh, <laughs> Yvette Avila coming forward. <laughs> Sorry for that. Okay. Madam Superintendent. Yes, thank you. Uh, Bethany Sullivan has worked in the district since 1999 as a teacher, dean, and principal. After 12 years at Classical, Ms. Sullivan was hired as a curriculum specialist at McDonough Middle School. In 2013, she was appointed principal of McDonough. She is a lifelong resident of the city of Hartford, grew up in Blue Hills in the North End, and uh, has deep-rooted commitments to the city and our students here at Hartford Public Schools. She began her teaching career at Cork Middle School, um, where she was immediately recruited to go to classical um, to teach philosophy and logic. During that time, she was formally trained in the Paidea instructional model and collaborated with her colleagues on the application um, to the State Department of Education for classical to be uh, an interdistrict magnet school. I know that is a very broad brush introduction because I'm going to turn it over to Chief Avila for additional commentary. Good evening. Ms. Sullivan has been the principal of McDonough Middle School for the last past six years. And during that time, she has fostered a positive, she has fostered positive relationships, elevated student voice, strengthened school culture. Ms. Sullivan implemented restorative practices. She was able to support decreasing suspension by 80% and chronic absentee by 12%. She has also demonstrated improvement in growth in the SBAC test. Ms. Sullivan is a product of a liberal arts education and is a strong advocate of classic magnet schools theme. Ms. Sullivan, Ms. Sullivan uses data to drive her leadership and to support her colleagues and has participated in the middle school design team and has, has also participated on several district committees. She's a true advocate for all students, and she, she supports her families, her teachers, and her school community on an ongoing basis. Ms. Sullivan is very excited about the opportunity to become the next principal of Classical Magnet School. Thank you, Ms. Avila. Uh, does anyone have any questions or comments? Board members? I'll say I have a comment. I don't know you personally outside of today, um, but from what I've learned, um, I'm just hoping what you have inside of you to pour into the lives of not only your staff, more importantly the students that I get a chance to see what you've done previously happen, um, providing we appoint you tonight for that to come to fruition um, in your new endeavors. Ms. Clark. Hello, good evening. So um, my question is, um, as we know, some of the culture and climate at Classical currently is not in the best shape. And I just wanted to know, just hear a tad bit of your plan and which to shape that if you were afforded the opportunity. Thank you. So the school culture piece, I agree, is the most essential thing at this point to start with that classical magnet. Um, looking briefly at the data, I don't have um, access to the full data, but I have the overview. I'm noticing that suspension rates are really, really high, and that can't continue. 
Um, I also notice when I look at the suspension data that African American students are disproportionately suspended, which can't continue. I believe they make up 65% of the suspensions and 42% of the population. So that's one of the first things I would look at and um, work with the staff to, to stop that. That can't continue. Um, one of the things that we've done at McDonough that's worked really well is step one is focusing on the relationships in the building. Staff need to be close with each other and believe in the work that their colleagues are doing. Students need to feel respected by teachers in the classroom. Parents need to feel that they're welcome in school and have a voice when they enter the building. And we need to get all stakeholders working together um, because I believe that if you have those foundational pieces, then you can really dig into the hard work and look at the data and say, okay, we have a problem here. How do we collaboratively problem solve to figure this out together? And my experience, students have the best answers. <laughs> and I know classical students are very intelligent, have phenomenal ideas. They know better than anyone what's happening in the classrooms and the hallways, the school culture work. So step one for me is involving those student leaders and those students who feel disenfranchised. I want to meet with those students who don't feel as though maybe they have a home at classical and they're chronically suspended and sent out of class to find out what's going on because we have to fix that first and foremost. Thank you so much. Mr. Stallings. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, just to continue on the theme of culture and climate, um, and I'm going to add equity in that. If, um, from, from my experience, African American students at classical have been suspended at proportionally high rates. That's historic. So I, I don't want to go on record and sort of vilify the, the former principal um, because it was occurring before when she took the job. Uh, so that is an, uh, an issue across the system. Uh, and so I, my curiosity is how are you, what cultural competencies are you going to employ in order to build relationships with students? And uh, how are you going to, how do you navigate um, those cultural competencies with adolescents? So let's start there. Yeah, great question. So, you know, one of the things, you know, having been at Classical in 1999 when it first, when it transitioned from Quark to Woodland Street, you know, I think for some adults there's an assumption, oh, we have students from the suburbs and from the city and, you know, white and African American and Latinx all in one building, we've done our part. That's what Chef O'Neill was about. What really needs to happen though is that intentional work, exactly what you're talking about, of building up the competencies of the staff to celebrate the diversity within the building, to have adolescents come together in advisory. You're not just sitting in a circle talking about nothing. We're having real conversations where we're celebrating each other's diversity, where we're listening to each other, where we're learning from each other, we're understanding from each other. I think that the social emotional learning curriculum, the advisory curriculum, is a prime place for that work to happen. Those conversations need to happen. It's not just about putting people in a room or under a roof. It's about the real work that happens in the classrooms. In addition, when you look at the foundations of a classical education, and I always have the teacher lens, right? Seventh grade philosophy, so I'll use that as an example. I remember when I was teaching Socrates to my students, right? This old white guy from thousands of years ago teaching his philosophy. Well, when you read Dr. King's letter from Birmingham jail, he references Socrates multiple times. And so having those connections where you're taking stuff from the classical world, you're looking at Dr. King's philosophy, we brought in Malcolm X philosophy, and we had the students engage in real conversations around, you know, here are different ways to look at the role of the citizen, the role of the, the role of the citizen when you feel laws are unjust. And then what's your take on this? What's your voice? How are you feeling right now about this? So I think within the curriculum also, there's ways to build that cultural competency and include the voices of all the students in the building, and you can design curriculum that allows that to happen in authentic ways, not in forced ways, and that's what I would hope to do. Well, just to push back a little. So today's youth aren't, they, they understand and know Dr. King and Malcolm X, but they will prescribe more to a Jay-Z or a Nipsey Hussle. So how do you take that literature that's classical in their environment and 
incorporated into a classical education, because when you say classical, you're talking about the, the literary classics, so forth mm -hmm. and so on. Um, and if I don't have, if I don't have the, um, the disposition to be a student, if I'm arriving at classical magnet school unprepared as a student, how do you take that raw student and then what process do you have? Because you have to, you have to break down behaviors, you have to break down trust, so forth and so on. So how do you take the hardcore inner city youth and tear down the defense mechanisms and then pour in education? Because education in a classical sense, in my opinion, it is a intuitive process. It's from within. So it's about students discovering who they are through your educational process. So how do you? No, absolutely. And I do have to say, given the current climate of our country, there's a ton for students to discuss and relate to today through music, through film, through novels. At McDonough last year, we did a whole project around the hate you give, and we had a, a community panel where we brought in community activists and policemen to talk about racial profiling in the content of the book, where students were able to take what they were learning in American history from 200 years ago and then bring in the context of here and now and today. And at that same time, the student who was um, shot and killed in Weathersfield was a McDonough alumni, alumnus. And so the students really resonated with how do we take what we're learning in history class, how do we take a modern novel, how do we take modern music and film, and how do we connect it all to get a better sense of ourselves, and more importantly, do something. When you look at the Paideia principles, it's think, discuss, act. Act is that last piece. So my goal at Classical is not just to raise awareness around all of this, not just to get kids inspired and think about where do I see myself in this work and, and, and what are my opinions on what's going on, but now what am I going to do about it? And that's the piece that really inspires me. I guess it's the social studies teacher in me forever, but it's that acting part. And so I think there are lots of modern connections that students can make. We have to look at the curriculum. The second piece of what you're talking about are the skill sets that students arrive with or some some lagging skills that they come in with, where it refer to as lagging skills, whether it's a self-regulation skill, whether it's organizational skills, whether it's um, self-regulation when you're upset. Those skills, again, I've learned at McDonough, working with my students, have to be explicitly taught. So whether it's tier one social emotional learning lessons in advisory that all students have access to, or it's taking you know, having social workers work with group of students where they have identified certain skills that a particular group of students want support with. But it all comes from that point of self-awareness. And I agree with you on that. For students to understand themselves as learners, as thinkers, as people, right? And then to identify those goals and skills themselves that they would like to work on and develop. And then look around the building. Who, who here can support me with this? Maybe it's a social worker on this skill. Maybe it's a counselor. Maybe it's my principal. But I think, I think the key part, and there are some intentional moves, which I'm happy to share with you, that we did at McDonough with character learning targets, self-assessment, student-engaged assessment practices, reflection on student-led conferences, where they reflect on themselves as learners, both, both the social-emotional side and the academic. And so all of that work is very intentional. You add it in layer by layer, and that's the work that I hope to do at Classical. Last question. <clears throat> When, I would love to see that uh, work yeah, you did at McDonald's. No, definitely. Last question, though. Okay, so uh, full disclosure, I have a, my oldest son was a student at Classical Magnet and was your student mm -hmm. at Classical Magnet and experienced an episode where he was bullied and attacked on a bus. And when we came to try to advocate for our, on behalf of our son, our son was threatened with arrest. Um, how do you, how would you, um, deal with the bullying situation and how would you deal with um, re, um, no, how would you help a student find their confidence after they have experienced a negative, maybe six months to a year, negative of um, experience in school to a point where they don't like school anymore? How do you engage that student? How do you re, um, um, 
engage that student so that they can build confidence and that they can grow and that they can find the love of education and learning. So that's another great point, and I do believe, and I wish I had students here to talk to you about this. This has been the, the heart and soul of my work for the last six years at McDonough. I have students who have been outplaced, kicked out of magnet schools, sent all around, shuffled around, arrested, all sorts of things. They come to me, and immediately in my office, it's a, hi, you don't know me yet, but I'm, your, I'm your, gonna be your best advocate, and whatever happened in the past is the past, and I'm here for you, and if you talk to my students, you will see, student by student, I genuinely have that approach with every single student. Unfortunately, I know that students come in distrusting administration and having these negative experiences, but they do not have them in my school under my lead. They don't. And you, when you think about the work that we've done at McDonough, it's really been around how do we support, and not just students, parents. We have some parents who enter the school and they're coming in with a lot of experiences that have been negative. How they've been treated by administration, um, you know, some of the language tra translation things that we've talked about. They're coming in with a host of things as well, even from their own schooling and experiences. And I think one thing that all of my parents and students would say, I'm welcoming, I'm never judgmental, I listen and I support. And I, I really mean that genuinely when I say that. Nothing further, Mr. Chair. Is this acting or permanent position? It's a permanent position. Any other comments? Yeah. And I, I just have a comment in that I, uh, my son attended McDonough uh, Middle School about seven or eight years ago, and I was uh, on the SGC there uh, for a couple of years. So I known uh, Ms. Sullivan for about eight years as uh, a teacher, a coach, a dean, and now a principal. Uh, and I, I think that, that you will have a positive impact on this school. I, we heard last week uh, a lot of parents who feel disenfranchised. And I've seen at McDonald the level of family engagement that happens there which is really, I, I've always lifted it up as a model for, for our school generally. So uh, I, I have a great deal of confidence in you and just wanted to say that and to have my colleagues here hear it. Uh, if there are no other comments or questions, is there a motion? So moved. Second. Uh, all those in favor of um, Ms. Sullivan's appointment signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? The ayes have it. Uh, congratulations, Ms. Sullivan. <laughs> and if there's I just, want to, like to say yeah, to I just want to say thank you very much and, and please know that the questions that were raised are incredibly important questions and I do take it to heart and that will be the focus of my work. I can, I can promise you that. I can guarantee that great things are going to happen at Classical for all students who enter that building, not just some, and we're going to have great outcomes. So thank you for the opportunity. I really appreciate it and I look forward to our next level work. Thank you. Uh, item 4.2, contract continuation, Hartford performs. And the recommended action is that the Hartford Board of Education authorize the superintendent to execute a contract with Hartford performs for the term delineated in the contract at an amount not to exceed $314,000 ending June 30th, 2020. Madam Superintendent. Thank you, uh, Chairman Flores. Just to give some uh, context, Harper Performs connects all of um, our students to quality arts experiences that advance student learning and deepen engagement in the community. Um, going back um, several years, Harper Performs was created as um, to be a public-private partnership through which um, 
Harvard reforms would aggregate and focus on the region's extensive cultural resources and put them to work in Harvard public schools. Um, and so the model emphasizes equal access to ensure that all students have planned, sequential, standards-based, high-quality arts experiences that support their academic learning as well as their social and emotional development um, while connecting them to community. Uh, specifically, uh, in uh, this coming year, Harvard Performs will provide arts integration student programs um, in all 30 Harford uh, pre-K through grade eight neighborhood and magnet schools. They're gonna deliver their short-term arts integration experience as tailored to specific grade levels. Uh, each program combines at least one um, art form, dance, music, uh, theater, or visual arts with one uh, curriculum area, either English language arts, math, science, social studies, or health and wellness so that students can approach the curriculum in a creative and engaging manner. Harper Perform staff prepares its teaching artists and um, art providers to work in our system through professional learning opportunities. Um, the uh, focus, if you will, the structures for this year with regard to professional learning, there are three. Um, one is a workshop. Uh, workshops and consultation for our district literacy coaches, um, having focused on grades K through two. Uh, last year, the primary focus um, this coming year will be grades three to five. Um, one of the things that um, Harper Performs was very intentional about last year was aligning um, their work, their design of um, learning to our major actions guided reading um, specifically. and. Um, another way in terms of how they will uh, provide professional learning um, is creative coaching series for grade level teams. So Harvard Performs teaching artists will work with grade level teams in schools um, to help those teachers enhance their uh, literacy instruction uh, in a way that engages arts integration strategies. And lastly, um, professional learning supports for arts educators um, throughout our district. Um, Harvard Performs will provide up to three teaching artists to lead interactive workshops for arts and music teachers during our own district uh, professional learning days. And so as you can see, in addition to uh, the great opportunities provided for our students, it is also an extension at the adult learning level. So I'll ask, um, Tracy Epicoli, Director of Arts and Wellness, and Dr. Negron to join us um, for any questions. And this is a continuation in terms of the amount um, of the grant as last year. Does anyone have any questions? I do. Ms. Brody. Can you expand a little, um, a little bit more? Um, the superintendent did mention the, because um, almost a third of the budget is for the professional learning. So I would like to hear more about that. Good evening, uh, board members and um, Dr. Torres Rodriguez. Um, so the professional learning structure last year was, um, as Dr. Torres Rodriguez explained, was very intentional around um, our district's major actions. So we focused, um, the teaching artists did, um, there were two specific teaching artists that actually worked very directly with our nine early literacy coaches who then go out and obviously spread the learning to all of our K-5 teachers. Um, so the major action in, in K through five last year was guided reading. So we wanted to make sure that what we were doing with the coaches could be spread um, in the guided reading block in um, the elementary school uh, classroom. So that way was through literacy stations. So what happened was the, um, the teaching artists um, taught the literacy coaches some strategies that they were able to then give to, their to the teachers that they support 
forth, how can I make a read aloud come alive? Or how can I make um, a literacy skill come alive through an art strategy? For instance, uh, making characterization, making characters talk through puppets. Um, and being able to explain that then to the students so that they're able to do it on their own and independently at a station while the teacher is leading guided reading. So that um, continues to be the focus um, for this coming year. However, it's going to expand to grades three through five uh, because it was down in the lower grades last year. So that's really going to be a major, um, another major uh, professional learning goal continued. Thank you. You're welcome. Anyone else? Ms. Strollings? Forgive me for the way this is going to come out, because uh, I really don't mean to be rude, but mm -hmm. how do we know that the students are actually benefiting from it? From, from the, the professional learning? From or from the programming? From the programming. Um, I saw a gentleman do a drum at Rawson. I thought it was awesome. But um, the, the, the basis of his program was uh, teaching, um, I think it's math. Yep. But I'm interested and curious about how in depth that math strategy went. Mm -hmm. um, I think it was a wonderful thing. I think it's a natural way of teaching math. Um, and as you heard me before, I believe that education is intuitive. So I think math is a, a natural thing. And I think um, math was discovered, not invented. Um, so I'm wondering how the student retains through this exercise some of the, the, the complex, um, some of the complex uh, ideas that were conveyed. Uh, Fibonacci is a, a, a natural thing. Um, so how, do, how does a, a child retain Fibonacci from the drum? Or how does a student retain Tesla's 369 from the drum? So how, how does that work? Mm -hmm. How do you correlate? So that particular program um, that you're referencing was um, rhythm and math. And so um, what that teaching artist does is he, he provides um, a one day, 45 minute session that we call an access program um, or an alignment program, I would say, because it really does tie two subject areas together. An access program is more of an assembly, so something that's going to give um, just exposure to an art form. So he goes a little bit beyond that, right? Because you were saying that he explains the math. And what he does a lot is, is explaining how um, rhythms in music follow certain patterns. And he's going through his, his, right. his spiel. And the kids get to play, and they, they make those connections. So something like that, that program, is um, the data is captured through teacher surveys, um, mostly through how the students are responded to, to the experience. Um, however, there is a lot of connection and, and communication between the artist, the teaching artist, and, the, te and the, the classroom teacher. So that classroom teacher always has the opportunity to expand on anything that the, the teaching artist does through, um, through their own classroom instruction after the teaching artist has already left. Something that is more of um, an integration program, which is a, a longer series of, of programs, would have, you would most likely see more um, concrete instructional improvement because it's a deeper, it's, it's a deeper lesson and there, it's over a longer period of time. So the teacher would probably have more time to collect that data, do a, like a pre and a post, Something that you saw was a little bit, um, was a smaller scale program. So is that done? Uh, does the teacher, have we captured that data? Do we know if it was effective in terms of uh, getting kids to learn patterns or anything like that? And um, I guess these were like fifth graders or sixth graders, so mm -hmm. is that pre-algebra? I did pre-algebra, I don't know, okay. I didn't want to jump over. But is that, because sequence and pattern is something that's prevalent in, in, in pre-algebra and algebra, so yep. is that correlation made? Do we know it? Do we have tangible data to, to say, yes, we are making that connection? Or how, do, how, 
how do we know it's working? Yep, I, I, guess hear, I absolutely hear what you're saying. At this point, each program isn't isn't analyzed that that way through each individual program. Um, every teacher gives data on how their students um, thought critically, you know, by the student responses and by the teacher observation of how they're um, connecting to the programs um, and how relevant it was to what they were doing in their classrooms. Um, but at this moment, it, it's not as granular as you're talking. But that's definitely something that, that we can talk about doing. Because you guys can go way deeper. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Nothing else. You're right. Anyone else? Does this program include our middle schools? It does, yes. And is that different from the K to 5 schools in, in any way? Yes, so thank you for bringing that up, uh, Chairman Flores. So this next year is actually going to be um, our first year that we're going to be um, starting to pilot some new structures for, um, for the middle schools. Uh, because they are structured in a more teaming way and obviously lending itself to adolescent voice and choice, um, Harper Performs in alignment with us are really working on how do we make that structure look different. So some of the in initial ideas were um, having more longer longer um, residencies in terms of um, for instance if a school if Milner wanted to create a, mil a, a mural that was based on student voice and um, something that students wanted had interest in um, that they would call upon a teaching artist who had experience in that and working with the students through you know a semester or a longer period of time to really get a, hu a bigger project um, sort of off the ground. Some other things that we're thinking about are how are we how are we asking teachers to select programs because they aren't necessarily grade grade level as they are in in K-8 schools. Um, so specifically Milner um, and um, the other uh, standalone middle schools will have an opportunity to sort of give their voice, the teachers will, on how that will best work with um, a middle school schedule. So, yes. Thank you. Yes, Mr. Strollings. I was just thinking elementary school, you brought up middle. Mm -hmm. Forget it. So, I'm curious about the programs that you have to engage middle school youth because that's a, a, a tough nut to crack. It is. Um, so, do you have an example or two of, of what kind of programs you have to engage because I've been very vocal for the last, I think I haven't said anything in two years about my um, interaction with creative writing. Mm -hmm. And so I'm, I'm curious. So uh, last year we've done, we did some professional learning around with our teaching artists who have programming that spans through eighth grade to ensure that they are revamping their programming to be appropriate for um, sixth through eighth grade and in terms of how it looks, how it sounds, um, how are they interacting with students that just the middle school brain is, is different. Right. Um, so there was some, some professional learning that, that I did with, with Parker Performs with those teaching artists just for that piece. Um, in terms of what you're talking about, we do have um, a, a host of teaching artists who are fantastic with middle schoolers. One is Kahim, what's Kahim's last name? Kahim Kelly, um, who does um, rap and poetry. And he connects with our middle school kids like no other. Um, and it's part of what you were talking about, that creative writing. And actually writing is, is really the lowest percentage of um, we see the, the lowest percentage of growth in, in student writing because we don't have that many writing programs and we know it's something that needs to improve on. Um, but he's one specifically that our kids just love. He connects with them like a, like a peer, like just gets so much out of them and really makes that connection. Now, dare I ask the question, is he good? He's awesome. <laughs> no, really. I mean, I, I say that because I learned to write a persuasive essay through public enemy lyrics. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't a teacher who did that, it was a, a, my friend's father. And so I, with my young people, I use hip hop as literature. Yep. So I'm, I'm curious about this, it's different from saying, all right, I, I, I wanna 
compile some lyrics and I'm going to entertain you. We're going to have a conversation yeah. versus um, I'm going to take this particular lyric and I'm going to give it to you and I want you to dissect it right. and I want you to think about it. So I, that's why I asked the question. So yep. get it. If there are no further questions, is there a motion? So moved. Second. Been moved and seconded. All those in favor of approving this contract signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? The ayes have it. Motion passes. Thank you. Thank you. Item 4.3, contract continuation. Harvard data-wise. Uh, motion, the Hartford Board of Education authorized the superintendent to execute a contract with Hartford Performs. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I can't get it up here. <laughs> motion that the Hartford Board of Education authorized the superintendent to execute a contract with Hartford data-wise for the term delineated in the contract at an amount not to exceed $225,000 ending June 30th, 2020. Madam Superintendent. Thank you, Thank you. Chairman. Um, Flores, uh, data teams provide a structure and a process in our schools for analyzing uh, data in order to impact instruction and student achievement. Um, its role is to monitor the implementation and then assess the impact of uh, what we uh, are referencing as high leverage instructional strategies, which are referred as our major actions, close reading, guided reading, and specifically. Um, we acknowledge uh, that implementation of effectiveness of our data teams varies. We have uh, still variants across our schools. And last year, um, we established shared expectations for effective data teams and provided training through uh, on-site professional learning and coaching support. As you remember, the structure for last year, uh, Harvard Graduate School of Education trained four district-level teams and 40 school-based teams in the data-wise improvement process so that um, everyone can develop the uh, practices and the mindsets that are necessary for continuous improvement. And specifically, this framework organizes the work of instructional improvement uh, around a process with eight very specific steps that fall into three phases. Phase one is you know, preparing to do the work, um, inquiring is the second phase, and then you actually act on uh, what the data are saying. Underlying each of the steps are uh, what are called habits of mind that create um, a culture of sheer commitment to action, intentional collaboration, and the relentless focus on evidence, which is what makes this uh, continuous improvement process so unique. Uh, because it's not only teaching an eight-step process, but it's changing culture as um, the adults engage in the practice. And so for this year, the focus of major action two is um, the second major action for us is effective data teams. We are uh, looking to expand uh, the depth and the spread of data-wise continuous improvement processes. Um, so along with Harvard, we will continue to partner engaging in uh, a tiered uh, implementation approach. So we have cohort one teams, which are 32 continuing uh, school teams that participated in the on-site training last year. Um, they're going to deepen their understanding and application of the practices through two additional full days of on-site professional learning. And then cohort two teams, these are 40 new teams that will engage in the four days of on-site professional learning and seven 90-minute coaching sessions to learn the habits and the processes uh, to implement the improvement process in their schools, of course, spreading the capacity of knowledge and understanding of uh, the process. And uh, because we are being intentional about sustaining the work, uh, 10 Harvard Public Schools educators who support uh, district and school data teams are engaging, um, as you know, to become data-wise certified coaches so that we don't have to continue to rely um, and we can build our own internal capacity. 
Um, they are going to serve as the teaching aids during on-site professional learning for this new cohort, cohort two, um, and gradually begin coaching the teams in the field through, uh, toward the spring of 2020. Um, you know, all in all, when, when we do the math, um, I believe we will then have over 600. Uh, do I have that number correct? Six, over 600 um, staff members that are well-versed in uh, this continuous improvement process. I um, will ask Dr. Um, well, Anastasia Diffidelli Dutton, our Director of Professional Learning, and Abby, I don't see Abby. Anastasia Diffidelli Dutton, um, Director of Professional Learning. No, no, Dr. Negron, our Chief of Ac Chief Academic Officer. Um, I don't have my glasses, so it's actually like, who am I looking at? Um, so Dr. Negron is available if we have any additional questions. Are there any questions for Dr. Negron, Ms. Clark? Um, apologize, uh, my apologies if I've asked this before, but it, the data that we are doing, um, having with Harvard, are, is it our data or they're taking the data? It is her own data, the data that's being collected in regards to her major actions. Okay, and then when it says, um, like for the responsibility of Harvard and their team of um, maintaining, excuse me, where I just lost my, it's basically maintaining the program learning platform of its participants during it during, before, and after the institute. Does this mean if we ever, um, discontinue our partnership that we will not have that platform? Or is the training inclusive of maintaining before, after, and during sessions? So all of them are our own resources that are being utilized. So everything that is being uh, used during the training, we have full access to that. So as the superintendent mentioned, we're trying to build our own capacity. Mm -hmm. So we're training those 10 um, internal data-wise coaches. When hardware support leaves the district, we still will have access to all the tools that we have been utilizing throughout the entire um, training these two years. Okay, and the platform that we're using is something that we've already purchased or is it something that the- It's basically all like internal, like- um, it's, a ro it's a rolling agenda, uh, so it's, uh, I think they just reference it in a very fancy way. Yes, I don't, but it's, I, like, now I don't wanna like, you know, I don't want to say that Harvard shouldn't be using that language, but um, and I don't want to downplay, yes. but it's a rolling agenda, it's a web-based um, agenda that um, mm -hmm. actually each team has and it just continues. And so it's this very long agenda of the objectives with all of the minutes that are uh, developed throughout uh, the entire learning process. And so that is a platform okay. um, that um, Harvard will have access to, but we have access to um, as well. Yeah, the, the word platform just throws me yes. off when you're talking about collecting data. Normally, the institute or whomever mm -hmm. is providing the support is the owner of the platform. Right. Um, so I just wanted to make sure that if we ever discontinued our you know, services with Harvard, mm -hmm. that our platform or whatever it is is and not in a, discontinued. In addition to the rolling agenda that the superintendent mentioned, we also maintain what we call the learning journeys that every team is also documenting. Again, it's a way to capture like all the learning that the different teams are going through as they're going through all the, st the steps within the data-wise improvement process. Okay, thank you. Um, one last question. Um, did we receive um, the breakdown of the budget narrative for this particular um, service? I'm not sure if we received that. You mean in terms of how much does each day cost? Well, um, and just like in reference to previous um, contract that we just approved, we were able to kind of just see how the money was being spent, um, like the services, if how much was going to the teachers, how much was going to evaluations, how much was going to programming. So I wasn't really sure for the breakdown of this particular one if we had received that. No. Um, 
However, um, it's solely for um, having their, um, the Harvard staff okay. join us um, during the on-site and throughout all of the, um, the nine the virtual additional coaching that they will receive in addition to the on-site dates? We don't um, necessarily see how they allocate in terms of paying on their end. Okay, no, that's fine. I just wanted to make sure with the things that we're responsible for, the un, any of the added costs mm. that would be occurred to us outside of what's stated here, because I know what we're responsible for is like distributing of the books and things of that nature. Do we have to, is there an added cost to purchase the books or is that inclusive of what's here? So all of the, um, there, are no, there are no workbooks, but there are, um, I recall, like the data-wise right, we, we provide them book. with the data-wise book as part of the um, reading that we expect um, the, the schools to do, the participants to do, um, as they're going through the training. But that is um, what we provide as the district. Okay, so it's a cost on us yes. outside of this. Okay, thank you. Mr. Strollings. Um, is this, is Karen Mapp a part of this program? She was? Uh, no, however, um, it is the very, the same intensity oh. uh, in terms of, uh, it, he's referencing a very similar design in terms of learning offered at Harvard. Uh, okay. This is in, in specific to family and community engagement. And so the design, Chairman Stalling, uh, Chairman, uh, board member <laughs> Stallings is the same. However, um, the difference is that this is a year-long process um, for our teachers to learn about the process and then for coaches. And so the same intensity at the beginning and then it just continues for a year. So my question is, and forgive me, I'm going to apologize in advance for um, people who are new and new board members, but how is this different from ANET and what's the other thing? That went with ANET? Um, uh, uh, city. Um, city Connects. Is city Connects. Is? How is that different? Because that was, that was a data-wise program where we were supposed to be capturing data, I thought. So it was a, there was a platform, um, if I remember correctly, and it kind of came mm -hmm. when all of that was already established. Um, but City Connects um, uh, captured the data into a platform, and we did not own that data, that data left when that contract, um, when we no longer, you know, renewed the contract. Um, so this is there. We don't. This is not a a, a data based platform. Um, the data that we have and the platforms that we have are ours. The Rise uh, dashboard, our Performance Matters dashboard, depending on what each school um, identifies as their uh, problem to try to address. Um, the data might look different, but. Um, no, it is not um, like ANET. ANET also, um, ANET was um, also provided us with a, a dashboard of, of assessments of, the st of students so that we can determine how teacher instruction was impacting mm -hmm. um, our student growth. And so it's, very, it's different. Okay. Um, there is no database platform that we do not own. All of the data platforms we own. Um, this is more about how you engage around continuously improving what the student data is telling us so that the teacher, in collaboration with his, her uh, peers in a grade level team, for example, can determine how uh, to change practice. So we finally got to the next step. Thank you. Okay. Slowly but surely. <laughs> So what, what we're saying in the summary is that we're going beyond just collecting data and what we're doing is learning how to utilize it. How to go deeper into looking at that data, what it's telling us, and then kind of turning um, that lens to reflect about our own practice, right? How our strategies um, having an outcome on students and then taking advantage of that collaborative process in a team of then sharing the expertise, observing each other, so that again, we can address whatever was the problem that was identified. So one last question, you don't have the answer if you don't have the answer for it, but 
So when do parents get trained mm -hmm. to identify and help their student um, as a at-school home partner for the teacher? So if you guys are learning data and you're learning how to educate and better equip teachers and better engage students, how do parents do the same thing? And if you don't have that yet, that's fine, that's fair, if you don't have it yet. But. So it, there, there isn't um, a clearly articulated plan to kind of extend to parents and students. What I will say is that um, the reason why um, DataWise was the identified continuous improvement process is because it requires you to have certain habits of mind um, around making sure that you are intentional and prepared and that you just get into the habit of inquiring and asking qu the why. Why is it that this data comes to us the way it does? How is it that we got at, you know, at, at this outcome or didn't get the outcome that we had? And so those specific habits, I believe is is the power really of this continuous improvement process because that is transferable to not only the adults but to students as well. And I would add that as part of the process, there's a stage when it's all about the assessment literacy. So it's about truly understanding what is it that we're assessing, how is it being measured, what do these numbers mean? And I think that's the area that as teachers gain a lot of insight into that, there's power then as you're holding conversations with parents to, to um, be equipped to better explain what do all these numbers mean, what are we truly um, getting at, what skills are we measuring. So I think there are opportunities, um, although I would, I would echo what the superintendent just stated. Any other questions? Yep, Ms. Oliver. Hello. Um, so one of the things I'm picking up is that uh, this new cohort would allow us to cover all of our schools. Is that true? So once again, we just like last year that we had um, 40 school teams participating. Mm -hmm. it, this will allow us again to bring in another 40 teams. So we're going deeper with the ones who participate, with the teams that participated last year, right? They're, we're not abandoning them. Mm -hmm. It's not like, okay, we trained you, you're done, go. We're still supporting them in the learning. And then the new teams that are coming on board are also going to get the training of going through the entire process. How are the uh, members being identified at the school level for the school-based team? So it, we've, just like we did with our major actions of guided reading and close reading, in sharing uh, what we call the Hartford Public Schools guidance document, we are making some recommendations as to how they should go about identifying people, right? So we do ask that it, these are supposed to be four member teams from each school. Um, we ask that there be an administrator um, present as part of the team, preferably the principal, but if not, maybe an assistant principal. There has got to be an administrator as part of that team. Ideally, we also ask that there be a teacher leader that is identified um, to be part of, of that group of four. And ideally, somebody that has an interest, right, in data, and um, that is comfortable in being able to then share knowledge with others. And then we also ask that they consider, um, in the other two, other um, staff to make that team as diverse as possible. So one of the things you mentioned is that this is an opportunity for these school teams to identify a problem. Um, what guidance are uh, you providing or, it's, or central office providing to the schools to help kind of focus that, whether it's we're having the guided reading strategies, whether it's chronic absenteeism. So how, how is that connecting? So that it's very formalized through the data wise process because there is one particular step where they will be asked, right, to start looking at all the data that they might have um, to then be able to uncover, well, what are, you know, what are some questions that I might have related to how the students may be performing mm -hmm. in any given area, right? So right now we are saying that they focus on a guided reading um, strategy to see, again, what data do we have? Go deeper into it. What's the story behind it? Um, and that's how they start kind of peeling the onion to arrive at, well, what exactly is it? What skill is it that perhaps we want to investigate based on the data that we're seeing? So it's not like we, a central office, 
will sort of like dictate to the school, you know, within um, guided reading, this is what I need you to focus on, or within close reading, this is what I need you to focus on. They're go that's going to be uncovered as they go through the process of looking mm -hmm. and really engaging with the data that's, that's at hand. Um, one of the things that we're also doing to um, differentiate the learning, right? So we start to establish that common language and go through a similar experience as we're learning the process. We do hone in on the guided reading and the close reading, right? We now have teams pending your approval tonight that will now be moving into that year two of training where we are going to say, you know, so last year you went, you now learn, right, the steps that you're going to follow to be um, faithful to this process. But now, like, start thinking about all other aspects, right? As long as it's honing in on academic world, and it might, it might result in something else that they uncover, again, through that analysis of their data. Okay. So, um... Okay, I'll hold it. I'll hold it for now. Okay. Thank you. I do have a question, Chair. Yes, Ms. Brown. So, this is year two. Is this this is year two of how many years, or do we know? Is it? So our plan. We knew that we cannot rely right on mm -hmm. outsiders to come in and support the work, and we were very intentional when we were thinking about um, partnering with Harvard that we wanted to have a strategy for our own capacity. So what we had asked was that this could be a two-year um, process because at the end of this year, we should have those 10 certified data-wise coaches, which means mm -hmm. we no longer have to re uh, rely on Harvard for continuous learning. We'll have our own people to be able to do that. Okay, and one more question. Um, so the cohort is not, is it happening during, um, professional um, in-service days for teachers, or is it happening during the school day? So there'll be two um, on-site uh, days that happen um, during the first half of the year. Um, so we are right, dedicating two, two dates. I believe the first ones are in September. And then there's two additional days that happen in the springtime. And then in between, they're getting virtual coaching. And that happens during the regular school day as the teams are meeting in their, in their data teams. Mm -hmm. but, but we are right pulling those four individuals um, for the on-site training because those are full days where Harvard comes in and they bring their, um, their, their teachers right to, to teach us. Okay, I just wanted to make note because we, this is not the only thing we have right. um, teachers in particular doing. And when teachers are not, when it's school day, mm -hmm. teachers are not in front of yes. children giving them instruction. Um, so I always, I'm always concerned about that because then our kids are tested a lot right. and they're not in front of the teacher either. So I just want to be mindful of that. Kids not in front of teachers. Um, and Even I, though the work is important, but yes. we we have to look at all that we have and how much we're pulling and who mm -hmm. we're pulling, because mm -hmm. sometimes we tend to pull that same wonderful, eager teacher that will be ideal for certain things, but we're using them for things that are not in front of right. students. So I completely understand where you're coming from. And this year, we're also making sure that we have um, a master calendar of all the professional learning that is happening because I want to keep an eye on that, right? I don't want um, numbers and numbers of, of teachers being pulled out and then so then who's in front of our students? So we're being very cognizant about how it is that we do that. Because mm -hmm. not only do you pull them out for that, then they have to be the teacher of the staff in the building yes. for a lot of the um, things that we're doing. So. Um, just a little concerned about that, but thank you. You're welcome. Ms. Clark. Um, my last question is just um, to piggyback off for um, 
Board Member Brody. Um, how will we retain those certified learners? Because we know that in the state of Connecticut, there are very few of those certified learners. So I know, I'm, I'm assuming at the end of this fiscal year, we'll have 10, and now they're going to be looked upon as the experts. So have we thought of a plan? Yes, we did. Okay. <laughs> because we know that that certification is a unique certification, will make them highly marketable, right? And we don't want to make this investment and then find that they're gone and then another district kind of benefits from our investment. So we were very intentional in making sure that through the application process um, that there was an understanding that they would have to sign, um, I don't want to use the wrong term, but an agreement um, that having received this training that they were making a commitment to, to stay with us um, for a period of time. Thank you so much. You're welcome. If there are no other questions, is there a motion to approve this contract? So moved. Second? Second. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? The ayes have it. The contract is approved. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Negron. Now we move on to the consent agenda. Uh, do we have a motion to take up the consent agenda as a whole? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Okay, the consent agenda will be, oh, all those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. The consent agenda will be taken as a whole. Is there a motion to approve the consent agenda? Or are there any questions or discussions on it? So is there a motion to prove it? I just have, I do have one quick question. Yes, so when we, so we're 5.4, we're saying city of Hartford, you have Simpson Waverly. That's what we're doing, okay. Yes, Mr. Jones. Is the building gonna be cleaned out before we relinquish it? Cause we relinquished Clark and I just went to Clark and uh, I got some issues with Clark. Yes. And some pictures. We are cleaning and trying to repurpose as much as possible um, any and all furniture. We know that uh, some schools have already benefit, uh, benefited from some of the um, furniture that, has, that was in there. And we did not relinquish Clark. We approved its demolition, which has not happened yet. But it will be turned over after it's a vacant field. Uh, so is there a motion to approve the consent agenda? So moved. Uh, second? Second. second. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? The ayes have it. The consent agenda is moved. Now we have an executive session, and uh, the agenda says executive session for pending litigation and collective bargaining. We will not be addressing the pending litigation because uh, we require the presence of our corporation counsel who could not be here. So we will only be addressing the collective bargaining agreement. We want to invite our executive director of human resources, uh, Ms. Natasha Banks, our attorneys, Melinda Kaufman and Julia Wilde, and Superintendent Dr. Leslie Torres Rodriguez. Is there a motion to go into executive session? So moved. Second. All those in favor of going into executive session, signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? We are now in executive session. Oh, is there a motion to come out of executive session? So moved. Second. All those in favor coming out of executive session, signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Hey, the ayes have it. We are out of executive session. Our final item on the business agendas, item seven. I'm sorry. <laughs> item 7.1, proposed collective bargaining agreement uh, Hartford Public Schools Support Supervisors Association and the recommended actions that the Board of Education approve the proposed collective bargaining agreement 
with the Hartford School Super Board Supervisors, Local 78, AFSA, AFL-CIO. Is there a motion to approve? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Any questions? Hearing none, uh, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? The ayes have it, the motion is approved. Is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? The ayes have it, we are adjourned. <laughs>